Order! Questions to the Prime Minister. Mr Geoffrey Robinson. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. As we approach recess, I'm sure that members from all sides will wish to thank the staff of this House for their dedication to our work here in what has been a particularly challenging year. We saw terrorists attack our democracy and our way of life, not just in the Westminster attack, but also obviously in the attacks at Manchester, Finsbury Park and London Bridge. And it's thanks to the professionalism and bravery of people like Elizabeth Bryan, an off-duty A&E nurse from Cambridgeshire, who ran to help at the scene of the Borough Market attack and who is with us in the gallery today. That these attacks, this shows that these attacks will never succeed because we are united in defending the values that define our nation. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr Geoffrey Robinson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Of course, we in the whole House associate uh, with the words the Prime Minister spoke about defending our values. But I wonder, her schedule doesn't seem so busy, could she find time to visit Coventry, where I can assure a very warm welcome from the three Labour MPs in Coventry, who all doubled their majorities and held the recent general election called by herself. Yeah. Very grateful for that. On a serious note, is she aware that Coventry is the national centre, designated national centre for the research and development of controls for driverless vehicles? And would she not consider perhaps it might be an appropriate location to relocate her whole government there where she's the controls for driverless vehicles in practice? Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm always happy to visit the West Midlands, and I have to say I'm particularly pleased to visit the West Midlands under its new Mayor, Andy Street. He's doing a very good job. And he mentions the question of automated vehicles. This country is a leader in automated vehicles. That's part of building a strong economy, and that's what this government is doing. Helen Waitley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, our National Health Service was judged the best healthcare system. Best, safest, most affordable, better than France, Germany, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, Australia, New Zealand. Too often in this House, we focus on the negatives, and I've heard the Labour Party attempt to weaponise the NHS. friend, and I hope the Leader of the Opposition, when he stands, congratulate NHS staff on their skills, dedication, on their skills, dedication and the hard work they have put in to achieve these high standards. Well, can I, can I thank my honourable friend? I am very happy to stand here and to congratulate all those NHS staff who are delivering delivering such a fantastic service and who have made the NHS once again, because this isn't the first time, once again the number one health system in the world. And we are determined, we are determined to continue to enable that high level of service to be provided, which is why between 2015 and 2020 we will be investing over half a trillion pounds in our NHS. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I join the Prime Minister in thanking all the staff of this House for all the work they do all the year round. They are fantastic, they're supportive, they're inclusive, and they're great with the public who come here. I want to thank them for everything they do. Uh, I also join the Prime Minister in thanking all of our emergency services for the way they coped with all the terrible emergencies we've had over the last few months in this country. And I thank those communities, such as my own in Finsbury Park, that have come together to oppose those who try to divide us as a community and a people. And the emergency services were in action again yesterday, protecting the people of Coverack from the flood that they suffered. We should always remember we rely on those services. Mr Speaker, the Chancellor said this week that some public service servants are overpaid. Given the Prime Minister has had to administer a slapdown to her squabbling Cabinet, does she think the, Pri- the Chancellor was actually talking about her own ministers? Can I, 
Can I first of all? Can I first of all join the right honourable gentleman, not only in praising the work of our emergency services, but also in recognising the way in which, after the terrible terrorist attacks we have seen, and of course the Grenfell Tower fire, that appalling tragedy, the way in which we have seen communities come together and support those who have been victims of those terrible incidents that have taken place. And I was very pleased, as he knows, to be able to visit Finsbury Park after the attack that took place there and see for myself the work that had been done in that community and the work that he had done over that night in working among his constituents to ensure that the community came together after that terrible attack. Now, in terms of, uh, in terms of public sector pay, I will simply say this to the right honourable gentleman. I recognise, as I said when I stood on the steps of Downing Street a year ago, that there are some people in our country who are just about managing. They find life a struggle. That actually covers people who are working in the public sector and some people who are working in the private sector. And that's why it's important that the government is taking steps, for example, to help the lowest, those on lowest incomes through the national living wage. Uh, it's why we have taken millions of people out of paying income tax out of get altogether. It's why basic rate taxpayers under this government have seen a tax cut of the equivalent of £1,000. But you only get that with a strong economy and you only get that with a Conservative government. Jeremy Corbyn! Thank the Prime Minister for what she said about my own community and I'm obliged to her for that. However, my question was about whether the Chancellor had said public service workers are overpaid or not. The reality in this country, Mr Speaker, is simply this. A nurse on a median salary starts on 23,000. Police officers, 22,800. Job centre clerks on 15,000. I had a letter from Sarah who wrote to me this week about her sister-in-law who is a nurse, and I quote, she has sacrificed her health for the caring of others. She's had a pay freeze for the last five years. Only her dedication and passion for her vocation keeps her going. Why is this happening? What does the Prime Minister say to Sarah and those others working in our NHS? Right, honourable gentlemen, what I say to Sarah and to those working in the National Health Service is that we recognise the excellent work that they're doing. We recognise the sacrifice that they and others have made over the last over the last seven years. That sacrifice has been made because we had to deal with the biggest deficit in our peacetime history left by a Labour government. And as we look at public sector pay. As we look at public sector pay, we do balance being fair to public sector workers, protecting jobs and being fair to those who pay for them. And the right honourable gentleman seems to think that it's possible to go around promising people more money and promise that nobody is ever going to have to pay for it. He and I, he and I do both value public sector workers. We both value our public sector services. The difference is, on this side of the House, we know you have to pay for them. Jeremy Corbyn! The Prime Minister doesn't seem to have had any problem finding money to pay for the DUP's support. Her government government has been in office. Mr Speaker, the Conservatives have been in office for 84 months. 52 of those months have seen a real fall in wages and income in our country. And in the last Prime Minister's question time before the general election, the Prime Minister, the same Prime Minister, said, and I quote, every vote for me is a vote for a strong economy with the benefits felt by everyone across the country. Does the Prime Minister agree you cannot have a strong economy when six million people are earning less than the living wage. I'll tell tell the right honourable gentleman when you can't have a strong economy. It's when you adopt Labour Party policies of half a trillion pounds extra borrowing, which will mean more spending, more borrowing, higher prices, higher taxes and fewer jobs. The Labour government crashed the economy. The Conservative government has come in. More people in work. Can I invite the Prime Minister to take a check with reality on this? One, Mr. 
Mr Speaker, one in eight workers in the United Kingdom, that is 3.8 million people in work, are now living in poverty. 55% of people in poverty are in working households. The Prime Minister's lack of touch with reality goes like this. Low pay in Britain is holding people back at a time of rising housing costs, rising food prices and rising transport costs. It threatens people's living standards and rising consumer debt and falling savings threatens our economic stability. Why doesn't the Prime Minister understand that low pay is a threat to an already weakening economy? What? The best route out of poverty is through work. And what we now see is hundreds. Yes, it is. Yeah, order, order, order. The question has been asked. The Prime Minister's answer must, and however long it takes, it will be heard. The Prime Minister. The best route out of poverty is through work. That's why it's so important that over the last seven years we have seen three million more jobs being created in our economy. It's why we now see so many thousands of people in households with work rather than in workless households. Many more, hundreds of thousands more children being brought up in a household where there is work rather than a failure uh, to have work. That's what's important. But what's important for government as well? is to ensure that we do provide support to people. That's why we created the National Living Wage. That was the biggest pay increase for people on lowest incomes ever. When did the Labour Party ever introduce the National Living Wage? Never. That was a Conservative government and a Conservative record. Jeremy Corbyn! Uh, Mr Speaker, it was Labour that first introduced the uh, minimum wage with opposition from the Conservative Party. Mr Speaker, wages are lower than they were ten years ago, and the Prime Minister has been in office for just one year, and during that time disposable income has fallen by 2%. The economic consequences of austerity are very clear, and so are the social consequences. Life expectancy stalling for the first time in a hundred years. Today, Today, the IFS forecasts that income inequality is going to get worse and that child poverty will rise to 5 million by 2022. Does the Prime Minister... Uh, order! Members are shouting and shouting excessively. They must calm themselves, take some sort of soothing medicament. Jeremy Corbyn. I'll try and help the Honourable Member, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister not realise that her talk of a strong economy doesn't remotely match the reality that millions of people face with low wages and poverty at home? The right honourable gentleman is, of course, wrong in some of the facts that he's putting forward. In fact, inequality is down, life expectancy is continuing to rise. But what we know, what we know in terms of a strong economy, is that what will not deliver a strong economy for this country is Labour's policies of more borrowing, more spending, higher taxes, and fewer jobs. And what the right honourable gentleman wants is a country that is living beyond its means. That means, that means making future generations pay for his mistakes. That's Labour's way and the Conservatives will never do that. Mr Speaker, what we want is a country where there are not four million children living in poverty, where, where homelessness does not rise every year. And I look along that front bench opposite, Mr Speaker, and I see a cabinet bickering and backbiting while the economy gets weaker and people are pushed further into debt. Well, you can try talking to each other. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the economy is... Uh, order! The Honourable Gentleman for Stratford-upon-Avon is gesticulating in a distinctly eccentric manner. <laughs> and he must stop doing so. Shakespeare. Shakespeare's county deserves better. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the reality is 
wages are falling, the economy is slowing, yeah. the construction sector in recession, trade deficit widening, and we face crucial Brexit negotiations. Isn't the truth that this divided government is unable to give this country the leadership it so desperately needs now to deal with these issues? I'll tell the right honourable gentleman the reality. The reality is that he is always talking Britain down, and we are leading Britain forward. And let's look at the record of the Conservatives in government. Three million more jobs, four million people out of paying income tax altogether, over 30 million people with a cut in their income tax, record levels of people in employment, record numbers of women in uh, work, deficit cut by three quarters, inequality down, record levels of foreign direct investment. That's a record to be proud of, and you only get it with a Conservative government. gentleman knew how popular he was. Mike Wood. Again. The black country flag has come under attack from the other side of this chamber in recent days. But but will the Prime Minister join me in again congratulating Gracie Shepherd, who designed the flag when she was just 12 years old, reflecting our industrial uh, heritage? And does she agree that the latest figures showing the West Midlands as the fastest growing part of this uh, of this country shows once again that the black country remains a great place to do business. Well, as uh, as my honourable friend says, he's absolutely right. The black country remains a great place to do business. And I'd like to congratulate Gracie on on designing that flag at the age of only 12 years. And I have to say that I think I'm sure that she and others, including the Express and Star, have been surprised at the attitude from the benches opposite on this particular issue. And I commend both my honourable friend and my other uh, uh, honourable friends in the black country and indeed the Express and Star for the work that they are doing to promote the black country as that great place to do business and to live and to bring up children like Gracie. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister believe that her government has delivered pension fairness for women who, like her, were born in the 1950s. Yeah, yeah. What, the, uh, what the government has is delivering for women is a better state pension for women, so that women in future will be better off under the state pension than they have been in the past. We are equalising the state pension age. I think across the whole House everybody will recognise that that's the right thing to do. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has found up to £35 billion for Hinkley Point C nuclear weapon, nuclear power station. Up to £200 billion to replace the Trident yeah. missile system. And £1 billion for a deal with the DUP just so she can keep her own job. She seems to be able to shake the magic money tree when she wants to. Can the Prime Minister now end the injustice for those women who are missing out on their pension before she herself thinks about retiring. Well, I I have to say to the honourable gentleman, I'm a little surprised, given his background, that he said what he did about Hinkley Point. Hinkley Point is actually privately funded. This is not money that is coming from the government to develop Hinkley Point. So I find that... I find, that, uh, I find that a little strange, but uh, we, have put, we have put £1 billion extra into uh, this question of the change of the state pension age to ensure that nobody sees their state pension age uh, increased by more than 18 months from that which, uh, which was previously expected. But I have to also say to the Honourable Gentleman that the Scottish Government, of course, does now have extra powers in the area of welfare. And perhaps... Perhaps, perhaps it's about time the Scottish Government got on with the day job and stopped talking endlessly about independence. Jeremy Lefroy. Mr Speaker, uh, businesses in Stafford and other constituencies need as much certainty as possible now about what will happen after we leave the EU in March 2019 for investment decisions they're making in the coming weeks and months. As the Government works on the comprehensive future relationship with our European neighbours, Will it also negotiate time-bound tra- transitional arrangements which prioritise the jobs of our constituents and the health of our economy? 
My honourable friend is absolutely right. As I've said in this chamber and elsewhere before, we want to avoid a cliff edge for businesses because people want to know uh, where they stand and to be able to carry on investing in the UK and creating those jobs that we've seen being created. Uh, there will be, as I've also said before, once we know, uh, once we've negotiated through this two-year period, what the end state relationship for the UK and the European Union will be in the future, it will then be necessary to have an implementation period when people are able to adjust to that new end state that is uh, coming in. There will be some very practical things that will need to be done during that period. And as part of the negotiations, it will be important for us to agree what those Im that implementation period or periods is and what the arrangements will be during that. Kirsty Blackman. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, since Winnie Ewan's maiden speech 50 years ago this year, yeah. SNP MPs and MSPs have been arguing for the voting age to be lowered. Mr Speaker, in recent elections, young people have proven themselves to be the most knowledgeable and most engaged that they have yeah. ever been. Yeah. I believe there is a majority in this House in favour of lowering the, lowering yeah, the voting yeah. age. Will the Prime Minister support giving votes to 16 and 17? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the Honourable Lady, this is one of those issues on which people will obviously have different views. My view has always and continues to be that 18 is the right age. We expect people to continue in education or training until the age of 18, and I think that's the right point for the voting age to be. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In Harrow and up and down the country, young people will be eagerly anticipating their A-level results to see if they will qualify for a university education. Could my right honourable friend confirm the dramatic increase of people from disadvantaged backgrounds yeah, right. going to universities yeah, 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 yeah. and can she think of anyone that should apologize for misleading the british public that's right yeah. I think, I think it's very important, as people are thinking about going to university, that they are not misled in any way. It is the case that more disadvantaged 18-year-olds are now applying to university than ever before. I believe the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, said exactly the opposite, and I think he should apologise for having said that. But I, I, think, I think, actually, the Labour Party should go further. At the election, the Leader of the Opposition vowed to deal with student debt. Labour were going to abolish student debt. Now they say it wasn't a promise at all. Students know Labour can't be trusted on student fees. Yeah. Mr Paul J. Sweeney. The, pr the Prime Minister will now know what it's like to have a job, but to lack job security. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it can even bring a tear to the eye. Ah. Uh, given her newfound empathy for millions of workers in insecure work, why is she now cutting six DWP job centres in Glasgow and also back office staff at Springburn in my constituency, where unemployment is twice the national average? Yeah. Well, can I, can I uh, start by welcoming the honourable gentleman to his, uh, to his new job in this house? What is happening in relation to the job centres in Scotland is that the, uh, we are ensuring DWP is ensuring that it is using the estate properly to the best advantage, and as a result of what is happening, no services are going to be cut. In fact, services to people using job centres will be enhanced in future. I think what matters, what matters, is actually the service that is provided to people attending those job centres. Richard Dra Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The brave men and women of our armed forces put themselves in extremely challenging situations in their efforts to keep us all safe. We owe it to them, therefore, to do all we can to support them and their families when they have completed their service. I warmly welcome the launch of the Defence, People, Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy yesterday. But can my right honourable friend tell the House how we can coordinate this excellent programme? <coughs> with our international allies, and may I wish her a very well-deserved break when she finally decides to take it in the recess. The, the, issue, that, the issue my honourable friend has raised is a very important one. I think across this House we recognise the importance of uh, ensuring that we are providing that support to uh, those who are in our services and uh, our veterans. And this issue of mental health and well-being is very important. And I welcome the new strategy that, uh, for mental health and well-being in the armed forces that has been produced. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the tireless work, particularly on the issue of mental health, of my honourable friend, the member for Plymouth Moorview, uh, because he's been working since he came into this House on this issue. 
but my honourable friend raises an important issue. This isn't just something for us in the UK. We need to see how we can work internationally on this, which is why we actually launched the strategy at an international conference. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State uh, for Defence yesterday, launched this as an international conference with counterparts from the United States, Australia, Canada and New Zealand. We will all campaign against the stigmas around mental health so that members of our armed forces and our veterans can get the help that they need. Dan Carden. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In Liverpool, Walton, my constituency, almost 40% of children are growing up in poverty. With schools closing this week and local support services cut to the bone, austerity bites and kids don't get fed. The Prime Minister's mission uh, if she sa- as she says it, is to make Britain a country that works for everyone. What is she doing now to stop kids going hungry this summer in Liverpool, Walton? Yeah. Can, I, can I first of all welcome the uh, Honourable Gentleman again to uh, his place in this House? And he's right that it is important that we look at the provision that is made in school for children. We look at this issue of, of uh, households and poverty. But as I said to his right honourable friend, the Leader of the Opposition, the best way that we can deal with poverty, the best route out of poverty, is for people to get into the workplace and then for us to ensure that there are other jobs, uh, better paid jobs, being provided for people uh, in the workplace in the future. Lucy Allen. A young woman in Telford who gave evidence in a horrific child sexual exploitation case five years ago is living in fear. The perpetrator who received a 22-year sentence is about to be released early. CSE victims are too often overlooked and ignored. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that CSE victims should be properly consulted upon the release of perpetrators and that in this case the perpetrator should not be returned to Telford? This This is a very important issue that my honourable friend has raised and we all know that child sexual exploitation is an absolutely horrific crime that takes place and it is absolutely right that victims, if victims are going to come forward to report this abuse, they need to know that they are going to have the support and they can have the confidence that they can do that uh, and be uh, confident in their future security and safety as well. Now, The Victim Contact Scheme is supposed to treat victims properly and it is supposed to ensure that consideration is given to victim-related conditions when they're looking at an offender's licence and uh, somebody being released. Uh, What I say to my honourable friend is if she would like to write to my right honourable friend, the Justice Secretary, with the details of the case, then he will look at it very carefully. Ian Murray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Interim Prime Minister has repeatedly refused (laughs) to answer the question from my right honourable friend, the Leader of the Opposition. So may I try again? It was reported at the weekend by his own Cabinet colleagues that the temporary Chancellor said that some public sector workers were overpaid. So can't she tell the House and the country and those public sector workers which ones she thinks are overpaid, which ones she thinks are underpaid and what she's going to do about it? As I I said earlier, I recognise that there will be people working in the public sector who do find life a struggle, who are just about managing. There will be people working in the private sector who are in the same place as well. I also say to the Honourable Gentleman that, as we have seen in the figures that have been released today, there are some people working in the public sector who are very well paid. Uh, and, uh, what, what, I, what, I, what I also... What I also say is that we need to ensure that government is when we look at public sector pay, that we balance being fair to workers, protecting jobs and being fair to those who pay it, pay for the public sector, and that also we give support to people to ensure that they can keep more of the money that they earn. That's why we believe in cutting taxes. Yeah. Mr Kenneth Clark. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Government is under predictable pressure on public sector pay and public sector spending, uh, which we'd all like to respond to if it was actually sensible to respond to some of these demands. But uh, does my right honourable friend agree that the only way in which a responsible government can actually increase public sector pay is if we restore to this country strong economic growth and a sensible government fiscal balance sheet? and that the biggest threats to our achieving either of those over the next two years are a bad Brexit deal putting barriers to our trade and investment or the return of a hard-left, old-fashioned socialist government. Well, my, 
my right honourable friend is absolutely right and as a very successful former Chancellor of the Exchequer expertise on this particular issue. He's right that we need to get a good Brexit deal, but he's also right that the policies of the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Chancellor, were they ever to get the opportunity of putting them into practice, would not lead to more money for nurses or more money for our National Health Service or more money for our public sector. It would lead through its higher borrowing, uh, higher spending, higher borrowing, higher taxes. We would see jobs going, we would see higher prices, higher taxes for people, and we would see less money available for our health service and less money available for our nurses. Gordon Marsden. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister know that her universal credit process is failing my constituents? The Salvation Army and Street Life uh, report that vulnerable Blackpool people are juggling a month's money without help, unfair sanctions for people with mental health issues, a six-week wait for money coming causing more stress, and a phone helpline which Citizens Advice says can cost claimants 55p a minute and 39 minutes up, uh, to answer. Couldn't she start by getting them a free phone number? <laughs> to the, the Honourable Gentleman, I think the importance of the Universal Credit Scheme is it is, it is ensuring that being in work always pays. What we see from the Universal Credit Scheme is that we are seeing more people getting into the workplace, uh, but the DWP is constantly looking at the scheme and how it is operating around the country to ensure that any problems that are uh, being uh, uh, raised by people are being addressed. Antoinette Sandbach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mr Speaker, thousands of my constituents and millions of consumers in in this country have to pay surcharges when they use their credit or their debit card, a highly unfair practice. Could my right honourable friend outline the lifting, the impact of lifting of surcharges on consumers in this country? Ah, My friend is absolutely right, and I think it's very important that this issue is being addressed. We believe that rip-off charges have no place in modern Britain, and that's why card charging abuse is going to come to uh, an end. Uh, this is about fairness and transparency. We don't want people to be surprised when they come to pay for something that they see an extra surcharge suddenly being added because they've used a particular card. We estimate that uh, in the we estimate the charges can add up and that the total value of these fees in 2010, back in 2010, was estimated at £473 million. That money is going to be put back in the hands of shoppers across the country so that they have more cash to spend on the money and on, on the things that matter to them. Yeah. Mr Pat McFadden. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In her Lancaster House speech, the Prime Minister said that the UK would be leaving the single market. Can she tell the House whether that red line on the single market also applies to any transition agreement or implementation period that might be agreed for the period after March 2019. We said we would no longer be members of the single market because we will no longer be members of the European Union and there are the four uh, pillars, as the European Union consistently says, the four pillars are indivisible and therefore uh, the other issues that we wish also to be uh, not to be subject to, like the European Court of Justice and free movement requirements, mean that we will no longer be members of the single market. At the end point, when we have, at the end of the two years, negotiated Negotiated the end state deal, there will then be an implementation period for that deal. But we are very clear that at the point at which we reach the end of those negotiations, we will be out of the European Union. Speaker, can I welcome the uh, IFS report this week into income inequality in the UK? The report clearly shows that, contrary to Labour propaganda, often repeated during the general election, that the income gap between rich and poor in our country has reduced every year since 2010. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that this clearly shows that those with the broadest shoulders are bearing the heaviest burden of dealing with the debt we inherited from the last Labour government? My, my honourable friend is absolutely right. The IFS report very clearly shows what he has said uh, today. And as we know, the top 1% of taxpayers are bearing 27% of the tax burden. That is a higher burden than in any year under the Labour government. He's Haig. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, NHS England commissioned child and adolescent mental health beds at a private hospital in my constituency, which recently received a damning CQC report. 
The CQC found the hospital was unsafe, not least because on inspection they found a young woman with MRSA with open wounds on a ward. Does the Prime Minister share my concern that a shortage of mental health beds risks the NHS placing very vulnerable young people in unsafe environments? And will she consider giving NHS England the responsibility and the resources to investigate the quality of care before they commission? I think the Honourable Lady has raised a very significant point. First of all, on mental health, of course, we are boosting the funding that is going into mental health in the National Health Service. We're taking a number of, uh, and across the uh, across the picture across government in terms of dealing with, nas- with mental health, and we're taking a number of steps to improve mental health. But she's raised a very particular case, which I'm sure everybody about around this House would have been concerned to hear, and I will ensure that the Secretary of State looks into the case that she's raised. Nusrat Ghani. Yes. Daesh's atrocities have failed to deliver a caliph and the fictional caliphate. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that our international partners must provide resources and commitment to apply international law and bring prosecutions against Daesh fighters and those who choose to partner with them, making it clear that wherever a death cult terrorist hides, we will find them and hold them accountable for their barbaric crimes? My my honourable friend is absolutely right about this. It is important that those who have committed these horrific crimes are brought to justice. We have done good work as United Kingdom in helping those in these theatres to actually be able to see how they can collect evidence that can be then used in prosecutions. We want to do this work internationally through the United Nations, and it's an issue that, in fact, yesterday I was speaking to Prime Minister Abadi of Iraq about, and we want to work with them and others to ensure that we can send the very clear message that my honourable friend has identified. Sarah Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Prime Minister agree that the huge increase in knife crime has tragic consequences for families in constituencies like mine? What will the Prime Minister do to work with me and other MPs across, across this House to find solutions to this blight on young lives, including looking again at the budget for policing? Yeah. Well, can I also welcome the Honourable Lady to, uh, to the House, to her place in the, uh, in the House. Her presence here, of course, has uh, enabled me to have a very good Chief of Staff appointed into my office in number 10. So, but uh, she raises this, this issue. This, uh, this issue is this is the issue of knife crime. She's raised a very serious issue of knife crime. The government has been taking a tough, tougher stance on knife crime. We do think this is an issue. We've done this in a whole variety of ways. Uh, so that now, if you carry a knife in public, you are much more likely to go uh, to prison. But we do recognise there's more to do in this area. That's why yesterday my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, did announce plans to consult on new offences to toughen up knife crime laws, including restricting the online sale of knives. We've done some of that already. There's, we think that it's more for us to do. And banning possession of dangerous or offensive weapons on private property. Uh, so the Honourable Lady has raised an issue that I think is important. The Government has been addressing this. We recognise we need to do more and that's what my right honourable friend the Home Secretary is doing. Sir Edward Lee. Before the election uh, the Government committed to removing the faith-based cap for free schools and even included this promise in our election manifesto. Catholic dioceses up and down the country are anxious now to open free schools and some have even purchased sites. Will the Prime Minister commit her government to honouring a solemn pledge in our own manifesto? My honourable friend will recognise that the reason that we put that in our manifesto, and indeed the reason it was in the school's green paper that we published before the election, was that we do believe it's important to enable uh, faith schools to uh, more faith schools to be set up and faith schools to expand. This is an issue uh, that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Education, is considering, and she will be publishing further uh, details on our overall uh, view in terms of improving school diversity and encouraging more good school places to be created uh, in the near future. And Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, the Prime Minister refused to make public a report on the foreign funding of extremists in the UK, despite pressure from all sides of this House and beyond. With survivors of 9-11 last night also urging her to make this report uh, available, will she explain if her refusal is simply because the contents of the report will embarrass the government's friends in Saudi Arabia, or is it because ministers care rather more about arms sales to Riyadh than they do about public safety in Britain? 
it is absolutely nothing to do with that. There is, uh, there is certain confidential information in the report uh, that means that it would not be appropriate to publish it, but my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has made it available on a Privy Council basis to opposition parties. Uh, Rebecca Powell. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, for signs of the strong economy that the Prime Minister has so eloquently been outlining this morning, you need look no further than Taunton Dean. Yeah. It is, it, it is a microcosm of the nat national picture with record house building, record employment and record government investment in road schemes like the A358 in the expansion of Junction 25. And would the Prime Minister agree with me that to further fuel the economic success that this government is overseeing, these key road projects should not just speed up traffic and ease congestion, but also unlock more jobs, further fueling the rise in productivity? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy to recognise Taunton Dean as a microcosm of the uh, excellent uh, economy that we see uh, across the country. And my honourable friend has made an important point, and it's a point that the government readily understands and accepts. That is the importance of investing in infrastructure in order to boost our economy. That's why at the autumn statement last year, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, was able to announce the £23 billion in the National Productivity Investment Fund. Uh, a <laughs> considerable portion of that will be going into infrastructure, and we fully recognise the importance not just of large-scale transport projects like Crossrail, like HS2, <coughs> like the expansion of, uh, of Heathrow, but also of investment in projects uh, at a more local level if we're going to unlock economy, further economic growth in areas like Taunton Dean. Siobhan McDonough. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Without legal powers, funds, criteria or schools or parliament open, Epsom and St Helier Trust are once again consulting on the closure of the hospital and the building of a new £400 million hospital in Belmont. After five consultations over 18 years, wasting £40 million of taxpayers' money, isn't it time for the Prime Minister to step in and put a stop to it and allow this important hospital to get on with the day job? Yeah. 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 Well, I say to the Honourable Lady that... Uh, I understand Epsom and St Helia Trust are indeed uh, seeking views on future specialist care at the Trust and how the existing buildings can be improved. I understand these discussions are at an early stage. No final decisions have been made. And any proposals for major service change will be subject to a full public consultation. He Ford. Yeah. Mr Speaker, not only has the Institute for Fiscal Studies said that we have the lowest income gaps for a decade, but the Office of National Statistics has also said that Britain has some of the lowest levels of persistent poverty in all of Europe. Very good. Does my right honourable friend agree that it is right that this country is governed by the true facts and not the fake news, and that this government is committed to building a strong economy for all? Well, can I, can I start by welcoming my honourable friend to her place in, in, this, uh, in this chamber? And can I say she's absolutely right. We owe it to our constituents, we owe it to the public, that we actually ensure that when we debate these issues, we debate them on the basis of the facts and not on the sort of basis of the sort of fake news that we hear all too often being put forward in this chamber. Finally, Jack Dromey. Um, Mr Speaker, Lakeside Children's Centre is a lifeline for often struggling kids and their parents in one of the poorest wards in Britain, giving them the best possible start in life. Yet Lakeside and 26 children's centres now face closure in Birmingham. Does the Prime Minister understand, understand that the consequences of her actions, £700 million of cuts to the City Council's budget, is having devastating impact on the provision of children's centres and will she act properly to fund and reverse the tidal wave of closures that will otherwise have a devastating impact on the life chances of a whole generation of children? Well said. Well, can I say to the honourable gentleman that obviously decisions on this issue are being taken by the Birmingham local authority, but it ill behoves any member of the Labour Party to stand up in this House and complain about the issues that we have had to address with public spending because they are the direct result of the failure of a Labour government to manage our economy. Order.